Okay, so let's get talking now. This evening, I spent time with a change maker and a passionate Ghanaian who seeks to continually contribute to innovation in tertiary education, specifically the engineering field. Yeah, he's fascinated by robotics, artificial intelligence, space exploration, drone technology, and hopes to get leadership concerned about the future of work as well. My guest is a recipient of the 2008 U.S. Black Engineer of the Year. He was also awarded the Most Promising Scientist Award, 2008 NJ Biz Innovator Hero Award, and was a 2009 finalist of the NASA Astronaut Candidate Corps, uh, a feat which nearly saw him land into space as the first African. And that would have been great, you know? Yeah. He's the former and founding dean of the School of Engineering at Ashasi University. My guest is the first and only Ghanaian who has 22 issued U.S. patents and has numeral, numerous technical publications. He's an engineer, an inventor, novelist, educator, and a thought leader, and currently the president of a very great institution nestled in the Hacho Enclave, the Academic City University College. Professor Fred MacBuck. Mac Bacconluri. I need I need a whole <laughs> lecture on this name. Welcome, Prof. Mac Bacconluri. Thank you. Thank you. Good um, to see you. Good I'm, to see I'm you. I'm happy to be here. I'm really excited that yeah, uh, you're on my show today because I follow you on Facebook. I see how passionate you are about Ghana <laughs> and how you fire left, right, center. Thank you. <laughs> I'm like, that's Prof. <laughs> But how are you doing? Not too bad. Not and you're looking bad. well as well. Thank you. But the gray, is, does yeah. it bother you? I, no, you know, I love it. You love it? I didn't. I never believe I'll grow old enough to have gray. You know, because so I, I see a few commodity. strands <laughs> in my hair and I'm like, mm, is it a good thing? It's a or good a, thing. It's a good it's, thing, it's huh? Beautiful. Okay, beautiful. awesome, awesome. But how are you doing and what's, what's really been keeping you busy lately? Well, um, I'm doing great. You know, I have a great institution that I'm working hard to to establish this niche um and to place it among the best mm -hmm. of equals yeah so that's what has been keeping me busy growing young minds um and essentially leading a revolution in tertiary education as far as engineering is concerned i know this week you've you've been busy with the science and technology fair yes at uh, academic city yes, showcasing some innovations and all of that yes tell me about that project so we are working closely with the national science and math team mm. um prior to this particular year most of the activities have been theoretical okay and uh, it has become necessary for us to bring the experimental component to it okay uh, to make sure that our kids are, are graduating with degrees but also with good skills mm. so we are hosting the first in-lab experimental hands-on type experience for the participants wow so what are some of the innovations that you're showcasing there so we've shown them our ventilator okay um, we are working on also a scrubber because when you breathe out covid you have to make sure that the virus doesn't infect somebody else our students are working on an electric vehicle um so oh wow interesting things going wow on. like uh, a full electric we are, vehicle we are building one to move around our campus hopefully one day when you come we can take you on a tour on i i can't wait i totally can't wait what are you eyeing elon musk <laughs> are well, you are you trying to unseat him no i no we're not <laughs> we're trying to be as good as him or better wow you know, i think there's a lot of elon Musk, by the way is south african you know yes so there's a lot of talent on this continent that needs yeah. to be groomed yeah we can't leave no. anything to chance that's that's totally amazing right. and and i'm sure it's been quite tough as well uh, regarding the times that we're in the yes. covid era it's yes. been quite challenging for you yes. and and yes. for running the university yes. has it well you th i think covid has worked quite well <laughs> believe it or not on our side because parents are now looking at their kids staying closer home mm. you know um, and so we actually saw a high spike on admissions during wow. this COVID period and then also you know working with a team of students and volunteers we started building events later to to really augment the crisis yes so we we, we, are, we are going to see a lot more technologies around healthcare. Yeah. you know um given the challenges obviously that we have when these things have to be imported into the country so what's the state of the ventilator project because i was totally following yeah. it uh, yeah. s uh, over a year ago yes. yes yes when the covid was uh, at its peak baby absolutely and absolutely. um you were 
taking people through the steps you yeah. know every every step of the way you kind of yeah. were updating us yeah so what's what's the state of it is it out is it commercial has it been passed for standardization yeah so we we got two hundred thousand dollars from giz or giz okay um to to basically develop the technology so what we showed you over the year was the prototype okay and you go through stages of product development before mm -hmm. you can actually put a system on a human body it has to be highly tested and evaluated to make sure that um, nobody dies while they are on your ventilator yeah and so we've gotten past that uh, we are actually at a point where we can produce a, a model for ghana standards authority and fda to evaluate um, and by the end of august we, we should be doing that uh, the plan subsequently is to build about 100 of those for hospitals in Ghana and in the Guinea. Oh, okay. Mm. I, isn't it a little too late now? I, I, is, isn't it yeah. taking too long? No, that's a, that's a fair question. Um, even without COVID, a ventilator mm. is an instrument that you have in the continuum of care. Yeah. And... And so beyond COVID, we still need that. Uh, anytime somebody goes through an operation and they can't breathe on their own, you need a ventilator. Right. And these things can be quite expensive, anywhere from 10000 to $80,000. And so for us to be building one locally, that will be under $1,000. That is quite remarkable. It is. Yeah. It is, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I was and, and we're also customizing it to a, to a, a fit and form where you can actually have it in an ambulance, almost like a, a fire extinguisher, okay. you know? Okay. So that is the other trust. And what we also have, which is quite unique, is you can battery power it for about 12 hours. Okay. You can run it off your car cigarette charger. Mm. You can charge it with solar and on electricity. And so this is uniquely an African thing yeah. because it takes into consideration the prevailing realities in our environment. No, I think it's totally laudable. Uh, I was just expecting that it would be ready by, by now, now. Because, I mean, COVID is still very yeah. rife and all of that. Well, but, I mean, a, I understand a, a the challenges. It's too yeah. short for yeah. a medical device. Yeah, I understand. Usually, that. these things go for about four years. Yeah. Now, so having said that, if there was an emergency today and people needed a ventilator, then all the FDA has to actually do is to give us a pass. Mm -hmm. you know and say put it on to people and you can do that so we can actually put that system on a human body today okay just the process the of process. formalizing it is what drags on forever well hopefully we meet uh, we make an appeal to them because it needs it needs it, it needs to, it be, needs to be out there yes. yeah it needs it to be out there does. so the good news is that the director general of ghana standard authority came to visit us and he's been very very supportive dr alice dodu Okay, that's so I good. think sooner or later you're gonna see it. We'll see it on the market. Later. That's really good. I'm excited about and it. And it's called Stella One. It's called what? Stella One. Stella One. And Stella is is a former UN um, diplomat um, who saw the news mm -hmm. and came up and offered us ten thousand CDs in support of the project. So wow. in recognition of that gesture, we decided that the first wow. model would be Stella One. That's awesome. Yeah. Have you had any support from government? Um, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> this table that I am shaking, I will shake it. <laughs> I'm optimistic. You okay. Know, well, I'm, I'm sure they, optimist. they will come through uh, very soon. But let's get to meet you. We'll talk more about work and all, but let's get to sure. meet the prof himself. Sure. Where are you from? Where were you born? Sure. A bit about growing up, maybe okay. your parents if you can. Yeah, sure, sure. So I was born in Baoleshi. Um, which is now called East Legon. Oh, top year, yeah. It sounds better for real estate. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but Baleshi is my hometown. Wow. Um, my mother was born in Labadi. Uh, my grandparents, my maternal grandparents were from Upper West, mm. uh, settled in the Labadi areas at the beginning of the Second World War. Uh, my father comes from the Bogonluri clan, uh, one of the prominent families in Upper West region. Okay. My grandfather from my father's side was the f one of the first three to go to school. So the Bogonluris have had three generations of maybe four generations now of educated. My grandfather was the chief of Wolo. Okay. And also a colonial government official. Uh, my dad uh, went to Pittsburgh School in Cape Coast uh, and studied stenography at the time. I think Pittsburgh was probably the only commercial school along the coast that offers secretariatship mm -hmm. and then worked for the Brazilian embassy for several years and then became special assistant to the minister for 
communication, transport and communication, um, Jato Kelio, who happens to be my great uncle. Um, I grew up in Baolishi, went to University Star Village from across mm -hmm. uh, the hospital. I escaped a few times, as I told you in our, in our little chat. Yeah. And my guardian angel was Nia Monkote, who was the academic headmaster. I think he was the head of academics at Presec for, for several years. Great man. Mr. Uh, Kote of Presec himself. I tell you. Wow. He used to hold the my great hands. Ni Amonkote. The great Ni Amonkote who never spared the whip. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I know. Of course, uh, my, my fellow Presecans and all that years would know him very yes, well. Yes, great guy. Wow. Um, I went to Nandam Secondary School, sub subsequently studied science. I uh, went to St. Augustine's College for lower six. Okay, okay, hold on. You let, yeah, let's, yeah. Let's, let's stay let's with the, <laughs> the period. Actually, I, 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 I want to delve into the, the growing up bit. Okay. Of okay. course, sounds like you are from a privileged home, would you say? Um, I would say privileged, but not too lucky. <laughs> Why? Because, you know, when my parents divorced, I ended up with my mother's parents in, in Baolishi, obviously, and those were challenging times. Is it? Uh, we used to walk barefooted from Baolishi all the way to University Star Village Primary School, started off as 13 students, um, most dropped off along the way, and... I think I was the only one that really went to secondary school among the 13 students that I used to wow. work for Um So, but you know, I, I wouldn't say it was all that bad. I mean, I had the best grandparents in the world. Um, I, I don't think, without them, I don't think I would have been able to do, the lessons that I got from them mm. really shaped the ethos of my journey through life. What you lessons? Know, the humility, Can you share some with us? You know, the humility, the, the mm -hmm. empathy, um, the drive to excel, the, the ability to want to be the best among equals, um, yearning to be the best, reaching out for the moon's unlimited potential, not not being held back by yeah. adversity. You mm -hmm. know, those traits, the immigrant traits of coming to Accra to make a better life for themselves, mm. uh, to, to, to have a family, grandchildren, great-grandchildren who have a place to converge, and the whole notion that you have to go out there and work hard for what you have. Beautiful. And that you should be kind to other people because it's not everybody that is as lucky and fortunate as yeah. you. And those are the lessons that have guided my journey through life. How old were you when your parents got divorced? I was six years old. Six years old. Yeah. Did, you know the, did you know the implications of that at the um, time? At the time, I didn't know. But what dawned on me was... You know, by the time I was 11, my dad was dead. And one time I was playing with my friends in the sand, in the city center, if you know Baleshi, where it was a village center at the time. And a gentleman walked by and he looked at me. And he, I mean, he knew me before mm -hmm. and the after. Okay, when we used to wear nice clothes from Paris, mm -hmm. you know, and now here I was. And then he said, Fred, is that you? And it rang a bell, like, because I, I wasn't really self-aware, you know, as a yeah. kid, you just grow up in your environment and you begin to accept things around you. So anyway, long story short, his daughter is at Academic City University College. <laughs> this very gentleman. <laughs> and I can't tell you how privileged I feel. And by the way, that's Nia Monkote's cousin. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. The, the, the. The circle keeps going. The circle going. keeps going. Circle know? keeps going. And each day I see here on campus, there's a special satisfaction that I feel mm. that I've overcome all the challenges and adversity and established an environment where I can project the next girl yeah. out of Balishi into into a different platform. At that age, when you're much younger, yeah. what were you fascinated by? Were you, was there a certain career path that you wanted to tow? Yeah, I think I really wanted to be a mechanic. I really, really want. I was so fascinated with cars speeding behind our homes. With I thought mechanics had the biggest fans because they were always driving a different car <laughs> and just speeding past. So I said, "This will be cool." <laughs> no, no. Let, let, let's let's say it well. Okay. Fita, fita. <laughs> <laughs> the English name for fita is yeah. a mechanic. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So and then you know along the line, I was also interested in the air force. You know. Because mm. if you live in Baleshi at the time of the revolution, 
you see all these uh, military jets who come and do their summons. I was like, wow, mm. that is really awesome. So I've always been on that adventure path. Yeah, you know? yeah. And then you uh, get into St. Augustine's. You went to Nandom. I went to Nandom Secondary School. Yeah. Uh, what, what did you study there? Science? Science. Okay. And so that year, I, I think I got the only distinction from the science class. Mm. And then I went to St. Augustine's College. And then one evening, I got an EMS from my mom. And she said, you need to go to the scholarship secretariat. I heard your name on the radio. So I went to the scholarship secretariat, and I was told... You've been nominated for the head of state award. This was 1991. Wow. And But you have to come and go through the process. So two weeks later, I went back, went through the process, and I was one of three that was picked, and two of us made it. And it, it, I, I don't usually talk too much about that part, but it was quite interesting. So even after we were awarded the scholarship, the process to go to America continued to drag out all the way into September when mm. school had actually started in the U.S. So I got up one day and I walked from Baolishi all the way to Bamakamp hmm. and asked to see Alaji Mama Idrisu, okay, who was my dad's friend. Uh -huh. Actually, Alaji Mama Idrisu was with my dad when he met my mom. <laughs> okay? Uh -huh. Because they were UP foot soldiers. And okay. Obechebi Lamte, the father, mm -hmm. then was hiding in East Lagos and then you know, Baolishi from Nkrumah. And my dad was a bike rider who used to deliver the messages with Alaji to Obecha Bilamte. And I was a kid. I was, I mean, I don't think I was even born at the time. Mm -hmm. But I knew the name because Alaji's name kept coming up when we were growing up. So I just walked to Bamakam, asked to see him. Mm. And I was so sure that if he heard the name, I would see him. And that's exactly what happened. Wow. So I walk into Alaji's office. He looks at me and says, you have to be David's son. And I said, I am. And then he said, when I first, when I, when I last saw you, you were this. Yeah. What can I do for you, son? And so I said, look, I got a scholarship to go to the U.S. And scholarship secretariat has been bouncing me back and forth. He picked up the phone and he called Samson AJ. And I remember the conversation quite well. He said, if my nephew doesn't go to the U.S. in a week, you have to report, you have to answer to the president. And the following day, I was on my way to the United States. Wow. <laughs> what a story. <laughs> I mean, you've, you've got guts. <laughs> you know, I, I, I push. I push yeah. the limits. Um, and lessons for my grandparents, right? You should strive. You should work. You should push. Mm -hmm. And don't hope things will just fall on your laps. You yeah. have to strive for it. At what point did you drop out of school and Mr. Kote had to come in? <laughs> And what made you drop out of school? Oh, now you're trying to get me into trouble. So <laughs> there was a bully in the class. Okay. And one day I just decided to fight him back. Oh. And physically. Physically. And he got hurt badly. And so I fled school for like six months. And Nia Mokoti always came looking for me. I said, I was suspended. He said, no, you were not suspended. You just need to come back to school. So every morning he'll come grab me. I'll carry his books. And we go to University Star Village. And that is how I reintegrated myself <laughs> into school, wow. you know. Um, and, you know, what, what used to happen then, because we were the village boys from Baalishi, the kids from Lagos was always picking on us, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So at a certain point, you just have to You're go like, knuckle, nah, knuckle to knuckle. I've got to show you who's yeah? boss i got to stop this. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure it was that or you just had anger issues? No, I didn't have anger issues. I, I, I just got to a point... So, look, there was a young guy called Alex. Anytime I would walk into the classroom, he would just come and knock me in the head. <laughs> just like that, unprovoked aggression, you know? Yeah. And after a while, you know, a man got to be... A man got to be a man. I can relate. I totally can relate. I did say him in Prosec sometime, but, well, that's a search for another day. <laughs> so now you're yes. on the flight to America to pursue what? Yes. So I went to America, and I studied manufacturing engineering. Um... At, at which school? Central State University in Wilberforce, Ohio. Ohio. Yeah, about 15 minutes drive from Dayton. Um, at the time, only seven universities were offering manufacturing engineering in the United States. So mm. it was quite a prestigious program that okay. I got in. Um, and because I went late, I actually had to stay an additional year. Okay. So it took me four and a half years to finish an to undergrad. Finish the undergrad. Yeah. And at this time, you are probably clear in your mind what you wanted to do yeah yes and what was it 
So I wanted to be an engineer, um, a good engineer, hands-on engineer, a problem solver type engineer. And so I felt I needed a body of knowledge in order to do that. So after the manufacturing engineering program, I went to Virginia Tech mm -hmm. where I studied engineering mechanics. Um, probably one of the craziest engineering courses. And then I went to University of Dayton and did a PhD in materials engineering. So it was a triangle, you know, a little bit of materials, a little bit of mechanics analysis, a little bit of manufacturing. And that basically shaped the rest of my career in industry. Okay. Now, so tell me about mm -hmm. what fascinated you by, the, uh, you know, about the models that and how they were delivered at the time. Yeah. You mean at the university? At the university, yeah. yes. So, look, God is a material scientist because he said, let there be and there was. <laughs> that's, that's a material scientist. Um, what I liked about my education was that it was very practical. It was translational. It was hands-on. You were not doing anything else that wasn't happening out there. Mm -hmm. In fact, University of Dayton, uh, where I got my PhD from, is the most funded materials engineering university in the United States, obviously in the world. Um, we work closely with the Air Force, or the problems we solve in materials went into sustaining Air Force material. So one of the problems I worked on while I was at the University of Dayton was that prior to th that project, the Air Force used to retire their aircraft engines within 25 years, mm. even whether they were old, broken, or not. They just retired them. And so can you find a way to prolong the service life of okay. these engines, which was really practical day-to-day -day thing wow interesting stuff yeah. so by the time you were done with the phd mm -hmm. were you clear that you'd get into academia i think i started off wanting to go to academia immediately halfway through my phd i just got tired and i said maybe i should go out there and work a little bit mm -hmm. so i went to siemens you know and siemens was beginning to do some translational engineering work in the 3D modeling, 3D space. And I got hired as a project coordinator. So I actually combined the last two years of my PhD working full time. And mm -hmm. so by the time I finished my PhD, I was an engineering manager at Siemens. And Siemens is a, quite a, a, a global company. I mean, their GDP is probably as good as the whole of Ghana's GDP. Um, and so I worked on new projects, like mm -hmm. new manufacturing projects. It was clear in my mind that I wanted to be in industry for a while before going into academia, okay. which I think actually is where my practical nature comes from. Came, came yeah. from. Okay. How challenging was the last two years uh, you mentioned? Oh, it was very difficult because I was traveling around the world. I was running projects in Singapore. I was running projects in Madrid, Barcelona, um, Caratiba, Brazil while I was still trying to hmm. do my PhD research work, I think yeah. that's where I started drinking some high blood pressure medication, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, it was pretty challenging, yeah. you know? So at what point did you decide to take an MBA at MIT? Because I yes. know you did an MBA yes, at Massachusetts. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. So after Siemens, I went to Beckton and Dickinson, um, and I ran the R&D group for their injection systems business, which is still the largest... Uh, injection systems group in the world. So we made everything from syringes, needles, catheters, um, scalpels, among mm. other things. And what was quite interesting was anytime the engineering team will engage the marketing team, even with the best technologies, they will push back. And the engineers will be like, you guys don't understand technology. This is really beautiful. We don't understand why you can't sell it. So doing an MBA was an attempt to understand the world in which I was from the marketing side. Mm -hmm. And so what I learned from it was that just because the technology is cool doesn't mean it will make you money. Mm -hmm. You have to make what sells. I see. So they were not dumb. They know what they were doing. Yeah. 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 Now it's making sense how come you jumped onto the whole ventilator idea. <laughs> you, you saw the need. I saw the need. You I, saw, the I need. saw the need. But, but you know, Bill, what was quite interesting for me, um, it was not just the need. Okay. I think what spurred me on was the euphoria, uh, the sense of emergency, uh, a certain sense of hopelessness mm. that the country is about to shut down and we were not even sure if we had so for me, it was more like a response, a military response mm -hmm. that 
we can't just go down without a good fight. Okay. You know? Yeah. And that there is the capacity to really do something. And I still I'm still quite convinced that this is a nation of intellect. It's a nation of infinite opportunities. We just need to get our art together. Hmm. If you're just tuning in, this is Joy 99.7 FM. This is Personality Profile. My name is Lexus Bill. This evening, I'm spending time with the president of the Academic City University College, Professor Fred McBagon Lurie. Yes, you can check out our live video and join the conversation on our Facebook. We're, uh, we're live on Facebook, so you can see the video and uh, join in our conversation, put in your comments there on the live feed. If you have any questions for Prof as well, you might want to put them there or send me a WhatsApp on 055 I'd love to read from you. We're having a very interesting discussion. So Prof, tell me, how That's different it. was the educational system that molded you mm -hmm. from the one in your country? Yeah. So, you know, what was quite interesting for me um, when I first went to the States was the determination of these young men and women to learn. The emphasis was never on the grades. And mm -hmm. so you find people end up in industry at NASA, see average students inventing and reinventing the world. Mm -hmm. And I came out of the system where everybody was always interested in what your grades were. You know, so the overemphasis on grades was mm -hmm. It, 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 it was a major difference in, in what I experienced in the U.S. And people wanting to be great engineers. You know, people talk so fondly of what there was passion. There was enthusiasm for it. I mean, people were not just going to the universities to study engineering because parents wanted them to or to end up in the banks with engineering degrees. People actually wanted to become engineers because they were interested in being engineers. And, you know, I did part of my PhD work at Princeton. And so one day I asked my advisor, I said, well, you taught at Ohio State University before you moved to Princeton. What was the difference? And he said, while I was at Ohio State University, most of the kids were first generation educated kids from the farms in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And they were interested in being great engineers. And then I went to Princeton and most of the kids were elite kids who wanted to be CEOs. So that is still the difference that I see, that there, there's more passion, there's the, and you are trained, you are also trained to figure things out, to become a problem solver, mm -hmm. a critical thinker, uh, a t and a team player. So I think those are the differences that I see, that you, you need to be part of a critical mass in order to get things done. Mm. And, and Dr. Boachi, you know, says it's quite right. He says, what we see here is a strive for, in for personal or individual excellence. Mm. We focus too much on individual excellence at the expense of group excellence. Hmm. You came back to Ghana to <coughs> take up a role yeah. at Ashesi University. That's correct. Set up the engineering faculty. Yes. And actually had it. Yeah. Tell me why. So, quite interesting. So, around 2013, I came back home to Ghana on a visit, and my niece was then a student at Ashasi University. So she drove me up there. I met Patrick, and I was really so impressed with what he had done. You know, so I went to Patrick and I said, "Look, um, when I left here, I didn't think I would come back and see something this phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have enough money to write you a fat check, but I guarantee, if you start engineering, I'll come back and help you." Mm. So it was a promise that I had to keep. Um, and interesting enough, when the engineering programs uh, was started, I reached out, um, spoke to Patrick, I met him in Washington, DC. And at the time I just got a new job with Abbott. I had an offer on the table as vice president for research and development at Abbott Labs, which is the largest um, medical devices company in the world. And my mom was visiting. So I said, mom, I went to Ghana and I ran my mouth. <laughs> now I have a job on the table what do you think and so my mom looks at me for a while and said son if you make a promise you have to keep you your have word. to keep it and by the way you've been here for 25 years let's go home and so that's how my and that's how me. your mom brought you home yes she did but wait I'm, I'm, I'm coming I'm coming yes. bro bro did, yes. you, did you have this conversation with your wife 
<laughs> well, my wife really never really, she, she never really integrated into American society. She always wanted to come back home. Oh, so right. she had actually left with the kids a year before. So that also made it easier, yeah, right? Because yeah. I wanted to be near the kids. Okay. So okay. it was, it was, um, my wife is Ghanaian, by the way. So yeah. it, it made it easy. Oh, you had to emphasize. The, the, the conversation <laughs> is easier that way. <laughs> okay. So, so now you're back home. You're sitting, yeah. seeing the setup at Ashasi University yes. up the mountain. Beautiful yeah. place. Beautiful. Uh, great vision as well. I yeah. mean, I've had a conversation with Patrick. Great yeah. guy. Yeah. His team is amazing as well. And yeah. you're like, oh, this is it? This is it. Were there challenges? Oh, obviously, when you're starting a new program, <clears throat> there are challenges. Um, I was the first person to teach engineering at Ashasi. I taught, so I wasn't just the head of the engineering program. Mm. I was actually in the labs. I was in the classroom. I was working with the students in the workshops. On the, you know, I was mm -hmm. on the ground, sleeves rolled up. I wore jeans every day to work like you would see at IDO, IDEO and other places in Silicon Valley. So hands-on mm. type experience. You did it for how long? I did it for two years, five months, even though I, I, I signed up for two years. <clears throat> and then what happened? And so then I was wondering what to do next with my life, you know. I've, I've come in and I've done my national service, you know, <laughs> literally, um, which I always yearn to do, you know. <laughs> I didn't finish this form, so there was no national service. I didn't go to the university, there was no national service. So after 25 years, it was time to give up. And I think Ashasi was the perfect national service. I was actually contemplating going back to the States. Mm. Mm. I was at the time. And then you why? Know, because I'm thinking that if you're that, having a good time, that's a good question. Yeah, if you're having a good <laughs> now time, now you're trying to trap me. I'm not, no, <laughs> not at all. I'm not. I'm just curious. So forgive me. But I, I, I would have thought that the Ashasi setup was just perfect for you. So, so I'll tell you, the roads were awful. <laughs> I was always at a chiropractor. Um, I spend weekends, and there are pictures, there are videos on YouTube with my kids. You know, my my little kids. Uh, fixing potholes on the Kitase Brikusu Road. Yeah. And so I was thinking if a visionary of Patrick's stature dedicates his life to an institution such as this, that had the children of some of the policymakers of this country at that institution, the minimum we can do is meet him halfway. It means get the roads fixed. And, and so, you know, I was kind of wondering whether I had made the right decision, really, because I wasn't seeing any help from anywhere else. That such an institution with a global reputation, with graduates that were excelling in multiple fields of human endeavor, mm -hmm. um, wasn't appreciated at home, then what does this sacrifice really mean, to be honest? And that was part of the reason. Wow. That's, <laughs> that's interesting. And, and, and you would actually, I, I, I think that you would actually replay these same concerns seen as yeah. the roads in front of Academic City yes. University are equally awful. Absolutely. So then Academic City, what was intriguing, you know, again was here was a family that was willing to put in $25 million to build an institution in this country with a focus on STEM. Hmm. I mean... It was worth the sacrifice, you know. If I could build another great engineering program here, because think about it, we actually need about 25 top engineering schools to, to play in the global arena. So my contribution, my national service was to say, I've done one, mm -hmm. I can do two. Wow. And, and, and this family is a Ghanaian family? It's an Indian family. It's an Indian family. Yeah. And, and, and you would think that maybe a Ghanaian uh, family or government or something should mm -hmm. champion this agenda. Yeah. What, what, what was the Indian interest in setting up the engineering school like that in Ghana? So I, I, they've been around the continent for the last 30 years. In fact, they made most of their fortune you know, running companies in about 10 to 15 African countries. And this was their way of giving back to a continent that has given them so much. Mm. So that's one. The second motivation was that as their enterprises expanded across the continent, getting the right set of human resources was very difficult. They mm. were bringing a lot of experts from India, which is quite expensive. 
And so could they also build a local talent pool to help sustain their business? Mm -hmm. So I think that was the second rationale, which okay. is quite laudable. So w w was it they who approached you or you went to them and said, look? Oh, they hunted me down like Red October. Oh, wow. <laughs> 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 they hunted me down like Red October, you know, they said, we like what you've done at Ashasi University. We want you to take this to a next level, you know. And it was an interesting value proposition, you know, mm. from a dean of an engineering school to really running a whole university with an ethos around what has I've actually experienced in mm. the real world of work, right? Yes. 16 years in industry, um, Fortune 500 companies, leading business enterprises and then replaying that in a, an academic setting i think was quite interesting what was the deal breaker for you uh that they wouldn't interfere with what i do and has it been so absolutely beautiful uh look i, I gotta be honest with you it's a very beautiful facility it's a very beautiful institution nestled inside a uh, hot show thereabouts yep and hopefully this the, i think you and i should join in the call because i've got interest as well okay the call to make sure the roads are fixed yes. because i i look at the facility the the infrastructure um what do you, you you've had you have this laboratory yes which is made with something yes space age lab sp yeah lab, absolutely with over 2.5 million dollars worth of equipment wow and, and and the road is terrible yes awful so please um it, i know i know the one responsible <laughs> is listening <laughs> to joy that's good, right now that's good please go by the transitions <laughs> to you know uh, academic yes, city yeah. university road yeah. and and do something about it yeah and just come inside and visit and yes. walk around and, yes. and and see how we can be strategic partners mm -hmm. in evolving this nation that we all love good stuff now let's talk about the university and running it it's been yeah. alive for how long i've been about three and a half about years. three and a half years how yes. has it been i know you've got uh students from all over the continent yes. as well not just Ghanaians. absolutely tell me about we, it we have students from 26 african countries mm -hmm. Um, we started it off three and a half years ago, a strong ethos around experiential learning. Um, you have to touch, feel, mm -hmm. live the experience of higher education. Um, it has to be contextual within the African experience. So we are not solving foreign problems. We are focused on solving Africans' problems. And we have a unique pillar called unified learning. And unified learning essentially mimics what happens in real life when you go into the, the workplace, where people from different backgrounds, different experiences, different cross-functional work together on projects. So whether you're an IT person, a computer science, a marketing communications person, we put our students into groups to actually solve problems. Mm. That's our third pillar. And our fourth pillar is what we call extensional um, and extensional means that we can't teach you everything in four years, but we tool you, we give you a toolkit that you can leverage in your journey through life. And that is the ethos that we push. It's very, very hands-on. You have to go into the lab and build stuff, you know. Mm. And I think that is, that is quite unique, even from the experience that I had in the United States. You yeah. Know? Um, in the U.S., you go take one class to on a campus two miles away, another class on the next, and you don't even know how the two comes together. But here you're on one campus, whether you're taking statistics or material science and engineering, you understand how the two actually comes together to solve real life problems. And I actually read that you actually got a, a accreditation to uh, to, to actually yeah. deliver courses in robotics, engineering, yes. Yes. and artificial Fishing. intelligence. Yes. The only yes. university in Ghana to be doing that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we are trying to play at the intersection of these new and evolving fields. So you take AI, you take robotics, you take biomedical, mm. and then you put them together and say, what happens at the intersection between robotics and AI? What happens at the intersection between AI and biomedical mm. or robotics and biomedical? And that is really where the future inventions are going to come from. That is where the real solutions will come from. We can continue to look at knowledge in discrete forms. It's a continuum. Yeah. You need to put all these experiences together in order to solutionize. So who are going to build the next generations of medical equipment, the next intelligent road construction system, solving challenges in governance, 
it is these new bodies of knowledge. And we can't wait till they are de developed somewhere else. We yeah. have AI systems that can recognize black faces. So who do you expect to design the one that will recognize black faces? It is us. And our kids are enthusiastic. I mean, you look around Ghana, and our girls are winning robotics competitions globally. Mm. And you, ha you have to ask the question, where do they go from there with that knowledge? Mm -hmm. And that is where Academic City comes in quite nicely and says, yeah. you can actually come here and study robotics, and you can go out there and build the factories of the future. Listen, I totally love the setup, and if the setup needs a communications lecturer, I'm actually <laughs> offering myself because the, the robots got to communicate. That's right. That's right. That's right. The robots certainly yeah. got to communicate. And, and we're actually doing that, you know. So yeah. the robotic stuff and the AI is not just meant for the engineers. Yeah. But we're also looking at how it integrates mm -hmm. into marketing, into communication, into finance. And so it's a holistic experience that we're yeah. really trying to build. Good stuff. I'm sure I'm going to be on your faculty very soon. I look forward I'm, to it. I'm, I'm, it's, it's, it's going to be on my bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> I need to do that. I'm, but I, I'm excited about the fact that mm -hmm. you're passionate about the future. Yep. Because uh, just like you put up a post a couple uh, weeks back on Facebook, looking at the future, yeah. and yeah. are we all concerned about what's going to happen in a decade, two yeah. decades, three decades? Yeah. What technology? I'm, I'm actually going to read, read the that. whole post because I want you to. You I want, want to get me into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it, it tells you that I, I kind of agree okay. with some of the things that you said yeah. in there. Yeah. So, guys, I, I, I chanced on this on his paper. He said, look, there's a lot of interesting things going on in the world. My friend Sian, we'll get yeah. to know Sian later, Sian will fly into space soon. Who says dreams don't come true? Now, lie. The battle for lithium is making Europe worried. Whoever controls the supply chain controls the future of electric vehicles. Uh, Professor Kujo Siwasari, uh, thanks for sharing. Online education is here to stay. China will soon access Europe by fast-speed trains. Hypersonic jets will soon be in vogue. Killer drones are coming. Medical doctors will be replaced by AI doctors. No national service required. Armored tanks will be replaced by uh, remote-controlled kill vehicles. Soldiers will no longer be required. Crowds will be controlled with bees of drones. Can I get a generationally inspiring statement from a single politician in this country? Instead of sourcing loans for vehicles to drive on roads that you can't build, think about the future. <laughs> the last two weeks were spent on silliness. <laughs> Welfare checks for presidential spouses, V8, V6 loans, and then, 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 then. Uh, uh, this station must be built. Otherwise, Kolibu without oxygen awaits all of us. Look, uh, and, and it tells me that this is a man who's passionate about the country. Yes. And I'm sure you'd see a lot of things, you'd want to see a lot of things fixed. Mm -hmm. What irks you right now? You know, I see so much potential in this country. Um, even as I travel around the world, I've come across so many Ghanaians you know, that are doing amazing stuff. You know, Trebi is at NASA. And as a Ghanaian, I always ask, what will this nation look like if we can aggregate all this intellect into one spot? Mm -hmm. So I worried about that. I worry about the fact that we have gold filings in our hands and we wash it down the WC. That what the youth of this country are yearning for is that one inspirational statement whether JFK is announcing America is going to be on the moon whether Bezos says that when I was a kid I wanted to go into the edges of space just that 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 uh, that pivot mm -hmm. that a nation can rally around I want to hear that I'm yearning mm -hmm. to hear a visionary statement that will coalesce all the energies of the youth because look this country has tremendous potential mm. when you travel around the world you begin to appreciate what ghana really is so i i want to see something on the sciences i want us to have a real translational educational system we like to say we have the best educational system one of the best in the world mm. but the outcomes do not show that so it has to be an outcome driven education mm -hmm. I want to hear a statement about energy sufficiency around the world I, I, in Ghana. Like, what, 
how are we going to solve our energy needs for industrialization? I want to see a statement around how this nation is really going to industrialize. So these are the things that keeps me up okay. at night. Well, Emmanuel Tuf Azebo in on Facebook says a very fantastic brain Lexus you have in the studio. Great guy by all standards. Thank you so much. And uh, Nicola says, please ask Prof, how can I patent my inventions and roughly how much will it cost? I've had three concepts for cars and I've sent them to a US car manufacturer, but they always ask me to get a patent. The uh, first one was a reverse camera in 2001. Second was car shield tinting, uh, darkening technology in 2017. Third is kits of cadence free technology in cars. You should advise me, please. And that's from Nicholas. Maybe before you do that, share with us some of the patents you patents. have. You have about 22 of them. I have 22 patents, um, mostly around hearing instruments, mm. um, processing of electronic data, um, and products. Okay. Um, essentially, you know, 20 to 30 percent of us actually have hearing problems without even knowing. Mm. And with all this loud music going around, there are a lot of customers waiting. Are you are you blaming me? My <laughs> <laughs> radio station. You know, and, and, you know, mm -hmm. they are they are essentially hearing instruments are computers in your ears. Mm. They take sound from your external environment, they process them, and they pass them gently into your brains, and then you can hear properly. They are very expensive. Some go for six thousand dollars a pair to really put them into your ears. Um, around the world. You know, 90% of hearing instruments that are made remain in the, devel in the developed world. Mm. Only 10% come into the developing world in China. Um, and, and they are products that we need here. We really need hearing mm. instruments in this country. So my patents are around, you know, developing new technologies to process these faster. And prior to some of these inventions, it could take you up to six months when you order a hearing instrument to get it. And with some of these inventions, you could have a 24-hour turnaround. Oh, wow. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah. So to his question about how he can patent his yeah. ideas and in his inventions. Yeah. Well, he needs $15,000 approximately per patent. If he wants to file a U.S. patent, okay, um, yeah. they can be quite expensive. Um, but my question to him is, why does he want to patent them? Because sometimes actually patenting your ideas exposes them and people can smith them, they can design around them. So there are other things we call trade secrets that you can actually maintain until you have a system that you can put out there. So I, I think this is one of the questions that you can actually pass my phone number to them okay. and we can have an online offline offline chat. conversation yeah. okay i think we'll do that i'll just connect you with him so that you can guide him sure i'll be happy that, to. that that process uh, we're, we're just about wrapping up but I'm, right. I'm just wondering you've done so much are you a rich man no actually i'm a common teacher <laughs> what, what, what are you saying like a teacher can't be a rich man like prof what are you saying i run a university because i've never seen a rich professor you I, know <laughs> so let me put it this way i'm okay yeah <laughs> Yeah, okay, because uh, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm so inspired by all that you're doing and I'm hoping that I could follow in your steps. Of course, ultimately to be rich and you are telling me you are okay. I'm okay. Prof, no, 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 no. I don't want to believe this. You know, Bob Marley was asked one time, he said, yeah. Bob, are you a rich man? He said, I'm rich in spirit. <laughs> <laughs> On that spiritual note, Prof, it's been great spending time with you. Thank I'm so grateful that you came to share a journey Thank with us. Thank you so much. And I'm sir. sure a lot of people will probably come by Hacho and check out the Academic City University College. It's a great place. And if you had to end with your final words and mm -hmm. a, a word of advice mm -hmm. to anybody who's listening, what would mm -hmm. it be? Well, I think we should all strive, work hard. We have a beautiful nation to build. We have to be committed to it. Um, nothing good comes easily. Um, you, we always have to dream. We have to be dream catchers yeah and not dream killers and um beautiful ghana i'm looking forward to to serve in any capacity that i'm called upon to do thank you is that a political statement i don't know <laughs> <laughs> my name is lexus bill i've been spending time with <laughs> professor uh, fred mcbacon louis who's the president of academic city university college it's been a great evening i've enjoyed it uh, looks like my brother uh, Wisdom Nuokbo has also uh, enjoyed it. In regards to Lieutenant Kendall George Wilson as well, and to Yao Sechi, uh, who says a great friend as well. 
Have a great evening. It's time for the news at 8 o'clock. Joy Headline News at 8 with Maxwell Ababa. Finance Minister K.